Hello, and welcome to Queer Legends, an oral history podcast. I'm your host, Sean Dern, and before we get started, I wanted to share some pretty amazing news with you. And the winner is... Queer Legends. Hello, I'm Queer Sean. Legends just won the award for Outstanding Documentary Series from the 2023 Canadian Podcast Awards. It was pretty amazing to be nominated, and we've been trying to convince ourselves for the last little while that we just weren't going to win. Um, it was a really lovely surprise and a great way to kick off 2024. So huge thank you to the Canadian Podcast Awards for organizing everything, as well as to the sponsors, Sure, who make all those lovely microphones, and to PodCamp Toronto. Lastly, we are really grateful to everybody who took the time to answer our super short listener survey. Our survey winners, Handmade Quilted Tote, made by Quilt Queerly over on Instagram, is in the mail and on its way to Mississauga, Ontario. So thanks again for listening and taking the time for that. Now, on to our latest queer legend of sorts. In this episode, we're going to learn about the last gay man in Canada known to be imprisoned with gross indecency charges. In fact, he's the only gay man in Canada's history to have been deemed a dangerous sex offender and then thrown in jail for life just for being gay and having consensual sexual relations with another adult male. To explain this very influential Canadian queer history story, I spoke with an expert on the subject, where it all started, in Calgary, Alberta. My name is Kevin Allen. I'm the research lead at the Calgary Gay History Project, and a lot of my work has been around the life of one man, Everett Clippert, who uh, is important to Canadian queer history. Thanks. And I guess that leads me into my, into my very first question is, who is George Everett Clippert? So it's Everett who George was? Clippert. It's Everett George? Actually, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, no, it's sorry, the, part of the historical record got his name backwards, and so it's been perpetuated ever since. But George was his middle name. And also he used to go by George after he got out of jail because he was known as Everett in Calgary. And so it kind of gave him some concealment. But he has spent most of the 60s in jail because of his sexual orientation. And his court case uh, made it all the way to the Supreme Court and led to Pierre Trudeau's famous phrase, the state has no place in the bedrooms of the nation. When the Supreme Court in 67 said that he was a dangerous sexual offender and should be incarcerated for life. So it was really dramatic and very unjust. And um, yeah, it led to some changes, uh, legal changes to this sort of status of homosexual in Canada. What can you tell me about uh, about him as a person? Like what was, what was he doing in Calgary and how did he end up sort of falling into trouble with the law? Yeah, well, he, um, he was born in Kindersley, Saskatchewan, but his family moved to Calgary when he was two. So he grew up in Calgary, uh, was a working class guy, only made it to grade eight, but was super friendly, super social, super gentle. People say he was a Calgary bus driver when he first got in trouble with the law in 1960. And people talked about what a a great bus driver he was. People would wait for his bus because they wanted to chat with Everett. And yeah, and then um, one of the young men he was having an affair with, that young man's father found out about it and reported him to the police. And the police came into his home and found his uh, little black book with his dating history. And he eventually got charged with 18 counts of gross indecency. He pled guilty and went to jail for four years. That sounds out. awful. That sounds terrible. Yeah. So yeah. So was there like a long lengthy process or they just sort of burst into his place and uh, they find this book or did he hand it over willingly? No, they burst into his place and sort of intimidated him. And because he wasn't very educated, uh, he um, wasn't very duplicitous. He thought honesty was the best policy with dealing with authorities. And I think he felt a lot of shame, as many gay men did back in the mid-20th century about his sexual uh, activity. And so he just wanted it all to go away. Uh, and so, he, yeah, that was his strategy. So he got out of prison. He was in for four years, was it? And then he goes where? He moves to the Northwest Territories because uh, he was sort of um, front page news in Calgary in the early 60s. And he had a big Baptist family, many, many siblings. And uh nieces and nephews and he just didn't want to kind of hang around with that sort of shame hanging over him so he moved to the northwest territories 
there was someone tried to burn down the mine manager's house at Pine Point where he was a mechanics assistant and the local RCMP officer, there was only one uh, up there, uh, looked for anyone with a criminal record and his name came up and he brought him in for questioning and asked him if he had slept with any men in the Northwest Territories and then Everett unwisely said yes for <laughs> well, how did how did do. that end up even coming out in the in the in the course of investigating this alleged arson? How does his past homosexual conviction have anything to do with this? Well, it was a criminal offense, and so he was trying to establish, you know, uh, if he was continuing to um, be a criminal in the Northwest Territories. And there's some uh, there's a couple one citation that or one interview that he did that Everett alleges that he was sort of intimidated by the officer. Like if you don't confess to, or if you don't, if you're not honest about your sexual activity in the Northwest territories, you're going to be pinned with this arson case, but that's hard to substantiate. And uh, at any but rate, any event, he, he chose, he chose to go with taking a gamble on talking about his sex life rather than going for arson charges. Yeah. Um, he took that gamble and people, his coworkers, his boss, who I talked to before he died, um, who was in his 90s, said like Everett was like the greatest guy. Everyone loved him. He was one of the only people up there that had a car. So on the weekends, they'd drive into Hay River. His boss uh, hired Everett as a babysitter for his young children. And he was just, he said, everyone up there was really upset with the situation. He ends up going to jail. And his it was his sister who ended up yeah. t- sort of took up his legal fight for him, and they went all the way to the Supreme Court. So his oldest, his only sister, he, uh, Leah, it was about almost a generation older than him, and their mother died when he was quite young, and so she was kind of his mother figure. And coincidentally, she worked as a legal secretary for the city of solicitor, so like the city of Calgary's lawyer, and so knew the legal system and kept challenging uh, with the support of her family, kept challenging his convictions. And so that's what kept progressing the court case into, you know, all the way to the Supreme Court. And his conviction, of course, by this point has also really kicked up public concern and outrage, even amongst people who are not necessarily supporters of, of homosexuality. Exactly. So the sort of tone at the day was, you know, we don't like this, we don't condone it, but you shouldn't be incarcerated for it. Uh, you should be like treated for mental illness or, you know, um, given other kind of remedial uh, actions. But um, the Supreme Court case was significant because they declared he was a dangerous sexual offender because of a legal change that had happened a few years prior. And so he was a menace to himself, a menace to Canadian society. He'd have sex with men again if he got out of jail. And this was sort of in some minds, particularly in crit- critiques of the day, there were people who were concerned that this ruling would end up suddenly making it illegal to be gay in the sense that homosexuality and its activities, like just going and having dates and stuff, would land all gay people in jail. Well, I think that's true. I think that's what the legal precedent was saying. <laughs> so it was it, fully criminal. It was kind of, you know, maybe um, sort of ignored or mildly, you know, just looked at to the the society's you know, corner of their eye, but wink, now wink, it was nudge, be, nudge. But it's yeah. it's it's crazy yeah. when you think about it that the Supreme Court of Canada had a decision that would have did criminalize homosexuality to the extent that you or I under that law would have just be thrown in jail for who we are. Yeah, and there's lots of op eds, you know, from papers, newspapers all across the country during the day saying, you know, this is too far, and it's even more ironic because. Uh, the UK, which we inherited our common law practice and history from, um, decriminalized it this earlier that year. So Canada was going in sort of the opposite direction that um, Britain was. So then in steps, uh, then Liberal Justice Minister Pierre Trudeau uh, introducing his legislation on, uh, sort of on a variety of things, not just homosexuality. And and Clippert, uh, he had a huge impact on this, right? Yeah, so... Um, I talked to his lawyer, Brian Crane, who still practices law in his 90s as well in Ottawa, Uh, a very interesting dynamic man who defended him. And um, yeah, he said that uh, they were there just to test out the case. And so Trudeau got elected the next year in that wave of Trudeau mania where he was going to like drag Canada into modernity. He wasn't really looking to be a hero, though. Oh, no, no, no. I would say Everett was sort of an anti-hero and never wanted to be, 
connected to the gay community. I know uh, people reached out uh, in different cities to kind of get, do interviews, like put him in gay pride parades, that kind of stuff. And he had, he, it was all shut down. He actually married a woman. After I was just going to say, didn't jail. he go and eventually get yeah. married to a woman? It's like, no, I'm not gay. Yeah. Forget this. <laughs> forget this. Yeah. Yeah, he just wanted to kind of live a quiet life and like forget about it. And it's not until actually his uh, wife died and sort of that generation of Clipperts passed away that the family would even talk about it. And then his nieces and nephews approached me because I'd been writing about it. But uh, before I started doing this work, there was no photo of Everett anywhere. Like historians and academics would reach out and ask. But like he, he had just managed to kind of like sort of uh, disappear from the historical record. Anything else you think folks need to know about this file and its influence sort of whether he wanted to be oh. a martyr or not? <laughs> like It yeah, was a pretty just, inf influential case. Everett's story needs to be remembered. And, uh, you know, Everett himself would probably not appreciate the fact that I've done all this <laughs> work. But his family, um, the next generation, needed to kind of heal a little bit. And I'm um, happy to report his Supreme Court lawyer, lawyer, Brian Crane, did in 2021 get his case expunged. So with the 2017 apology from uh, the Prime Minister uh, and in The Purge, there was people who had criminal records could get their cases um, sort of eliminated like they'd never happened. And Brian did it pro bono for the Clippert family and said it's an interesting bookend to his career. He was starting out as a lawyer when he defended him in 67 and then, I mean, he's still practicing and he's quite aged and um, yeah the certificate came through and so Everett was never a criminal which I think is a really interesting coda to his story that is interesting to think about it like that eh? at the at the end of the day at the, you know, here we are in 2023 as we record this and he, he was never a criminal despite everything he went through it's almost in a in a weird sense erasure right it's, like, it's a good. problem for it's a, it's, it's a good thing that's a problem for historians because they actually physically destroy records and things like that so um yes. it was a good thing you uh, did all the work you did so thank it, you for that. Sure, I've, got, I've got it documented it is critical that this kind of history gets documented so we are really grateful to kevin and to the calgary gay history project for preserving this oral history and if you want to know more be sure to go and watch gross indecency the everett clippert story it's a very short documentary over on youtube i swear it's a 17 minutes really well spent and coming up in Season 2 of Queer Legends, you're going to hear more about how Everett Clippert's case influenced queer rights and Canadian politics of the 1960s and how it simultaneously emboldened anti-queer initiatives by the RCMP and Canadian Armed Forces. That's all part of our landmark eight-part documentary about the LGBT purge coming this June 2024. Thank you for listening. Queer Legends and Oral History Podcast is a Secret Agents production and the 2023 Canadian Podcast Awards winner of Outstanding Documentary Series. Please remember to give us five stars or a great review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Deezer, or wherever you go for great storytelling.